Hey guys, Dr. Sill here. I'm a doctor in training to become a psychiatrist and today's video is gonna be about antipsychotics, something that I prescribe a lot, something I have to deal with a lot, especially in my current job. I'm working in an inpatient mental health setting uh, in a high security unit, so there's a lot of psychosis and people who need antipsychotics. So let's talk about it. The structure of this talk will be to start with a bit of the history and why they're important, um, their indication. Then we'll talk a bit about the first generation, second generation, and make sure you st stay till the end because we'll also talk about the third generation, which you know is a, pretty, a bit of a new term, but I think a useful term to think about. I'll also just touch on the side effects that uh, antipsychotics can cause. I won't go into too much depth in this video. I'll do another video with a lot more depth. Then I'll talk about the kind of factors you need to consider to decide which antipsychotic is right for you, and then we can conclude there. All right, let's begin. So the first antipsychotic, chlorpromazine, um, was actually thought to be an antihistamine type of drug. And it was found to make uh, patients before surgery feel super chill. And so this surgeon and psychiatrist teamed up to use it in people who uh, were not super chill at the time. So this is like the 50s, the 1950s. And there's all these people in like institutions, in asylums uh, with psychosis. Uh, who are not chill, you know, they are psychotic, they're um, agitated, disordered, uh, and they try to give the um, chlorpromazine thinking it would be a bit of a sedative, a neuroleptic, um, but it actually helped uh, a lot of people's psychosis and it cured some people's, well, treated some people's psychosis. And they could get, you know, discharged for the first time in decades of being admitted, they finally had a resolution of symptoms. This was a major breakthrough at the time, and this was really the birth of antipsychotics. And thank gosh they did discover it, because at the time they were doing fever therapy, giving people malaria, they were doing coma therapy, like giving people insulin to make them unconscious. They were doing ECT without anesthetic. Uh, they were doing all sorts of things. And it really started the um, psychopharmacology movement, the focus on using medicines to help treat mental illness. So it was a very important uh, discovery. Let's just take a small tangent about the term antipsychotics. Uh, personally, I hate when medications are described based on their indication. So what I mean by that is we say the word antipsychotic because we're saying it's used for psychosis. Well, yes, one of the use cases is for psychosis, but it's also used in a lot of non-psychotic conditions. And it's very frustrating because then when people have a non-psychotic condition but would benefit from an antipsychotic, there's stigma there. There's, I'm not psychotic, I can't take that. But really, the ideal way to describe a drug is by its mechanism of action. So for example, antidepressants is a bad term, but selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor is a good term. But calling SSRIs an antidepressant is misleading because there's a lot of non-SSRI antidepressant medications like monoamine oxidase inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, yada, yada, yada. So anyway, that's why I get frustrated with the uh, term antipsychotics. Uh, really, the preferred term should be um, uh, based on what receptors they antagonize. And the problem with antipsychotics is that they block a lot of different receptors in different strengths. So um, some textbooks actually just talk about the receptors they block most of all. So um, really, it's dopamine receptor antagonists for the first class, for the first generation. And then they call it serotonin and dopamine, dopamine receptor antagonists for the second generation. And the third generation, they talk about a partial dopamine agonist. Let's talk about the three generations of antipsychotics. Um, again, that's another terrible term, the first, second, and third generation. There are many first generation antipsychotics that are, should be in the second generation. And there's some second generation antipsychotics like risperidone are more fitting for the first generation. Really, this term is just carried on because um, it, it, it's the, the time course of wh when they were discovered. You know, the first generation were the first discovered, but Amy Sulpride has a lot of serotonin blockade. So it's actually considered one of the second generations. And, and in the second generation, they were discovered after the first generation. And, you know, risperidone is mainly a dopamine receptor subtype two blocker. And so that should be considered the first generation really. So, ugh, such a headache. So the way to, to conceptualize it, I'll talk about both first generation um, I'll, I'll use both terms. First generation, which is mo mostly a dopamine uh, receptor blocker, and more specifically, it's the dopamine 2 receptor blocker. That's the first generation. And then I'll talk about the second generation, which is um, serotonin and dopamine blocking um, or antagonism. And uh, the serotonin receptor is the 5-HT2A receptor is the main one that it blocks. Um, there's others that it, it hits as well. Um, uh, and, and the main dopamine receptor that second gens uh, block as well is, is the D2 again. But this gets very complicated very quick uh, when you look at all the different receptors that one medication hits. Uh, they're hitting sometimes you know, 15, 20 receptors uh, with pretty strong affinity. And, and so we can't describe a medication as a 
5-HT2A, 5-HT1B, 5-HT3 uh, you know, uh, plus D2, D1 receptor blocker plus uh, D1 partial agonist. You know, you can't call that the class of medication based on every single receptor it hits. So, so it's going to be a little bit imperfect. That's the way it is. Let's begin with the first generation or dopamine 2 receptor blockers. Now I'm using the term blocker to replace the word antagonist, but antagonist and blocker is, is the same thing. And so really these first generations are blocking the dopamine 2 receptors heavily uh, and they're not very specific. So there's four main dopaminergic circuits in the brain and you only really want to hit one of them, the mesolimbic circuit. This is the, this is the dopaminergic circuit that starts in the base of the brain in the ventral tegmental area uh, in the brainstem and then goes all the way up to the uh, ventral striatum in the basal ganglia and, and that's where the nucleus accumbens, the motivation center of the brain is, where the thing that makes you move and, dri and gives you drive and motivation. Um, but if it's hyper stimulated, but you become paranoid and start hearing voices and become psychotic. Uh, so, so you don't want to tickle it too much. Uh, and that's what's happening in psychosis. Um, we don't know why that happens. You know, we don't, the inputs are very complex, but the common end pathway in psychosis is this hyperactive mesolimbic pathway. And when you block those dopamine 2 receptors in the nucleus accumbens at the end there and in the ventral tegmental area, you're toning down the symptoms. The, the voices can sometimes still be there, but they get toned down. The, the, the paranoia might still be there, but it gets toned down. It's like a volume knob. And so we treat um, uh, you know, psychosis with these dopamine receptor blockers. And the first generation, some examples include zuclopenthixol, flupenthixol, haloperidol, droperidol. Uh, these, are, these are medications that are associated with lots of side effects. And uh, the kind of two side effects that we distinguish first and second generation based off of is that the first generation, these dopamine D2 receptor blockers, they're mostly associated with extra pyramidal side effects, that is movement side effects. Um, the, we call them EPSE, so extra pyramidal side effects. And, and there's four we usually talk about. Um, it's, it's more, it always gets more complicated the deeper you go, but we can just talk about four, akathisia, uh, tardive dyskinesia, dystonia, and drug-induced Parkinsonism. We won't go through them all in depth uh, right now. I'll do that in the next video. But to just quickly talk about it, it's really issues in the basal ganglia, the balance between dopamine and acetylcholine in certain complex uh, direct and indir indirect pathways. Uh, and so, as we said, you know, the, the D2 blockers, these drugs, they, they're not specific for just the mesolimbic circuit. They also hit another circuit called the nagrostriatal circuit, causing all these problems in the basal ganglia and all these side effects. Now, not everyone gets these side effects. You might not get these side effects. You probably won't get these side effects. But it's just worth noting that if you're feeling movement issues, such as being stiff or such as being jittery or, or whatever it is, you need to talk to your doctor, um, uh, either you or your loved one, whoever you're watching this for, and, and talk to them about um, the management because they all have uh, you know, management options. Um, and, and, and so talk to your doctor. Now, the second generation antipsychotics, these are things like um, Risperidone, quetiapine, olanzapine. Um, I'm going to leave clozapine as a separate one. Anisulpride, uh, there's a couple others. These, these medications really target serotonin um, uh, blockade also. Uh, and the thinking is that uh, another brainstem, nucle brainstem nucleus called the Raffi nuclei, which is where serotonergic um, neurons kind of originate from, um, that connects to the uh, mesolimbic circuit via that, like it has like inputs to the ventral tegmental area there and, and it stimulates it. So if you block that by blocking serotonin, you can decrease that mesolimbic psychotic output. Uh, well, look, um, that's the thinking so far. It's, you know, it's complicated and, and the tools we have to investigate this are imperfect. Um, but it's very effective to, to tone down serotonin uh, on certain receptors, the 5-HT2A receptor specifically. To tone that down, um, uh, it does actually reduce uh, psychotic symptoms substantially, and some of these second generations work better than first generations. Um, but everyone's different. Everyone's psychosis is a little different, so you have to work with your psychiatrist to find the right uh, medication regime for, for you. Um, now, the common side effect discussed in these second generation antipsychotics is um, weight gain, uh, diabetes, you know, uh, metabolic syndrome, like diabetes, high blood pressure, weight gain, um, and, and, and sedation. And the reason this is, is because it's hitting a lot of other receptors other than just D2. So the antihistamine, anti-noradrenaline, and anti-serotonergic effects of 
these medications results in um, a, a kind of sedation, a lack of energy, uh, and so you get weight gain, you eat a lot, uh, you get very hungry, um, and you don't always have the motivation to kind of go to the gym or you don't have the kind of frontal cortex power to say don't have another bite of that or don't go to Macca's. So there's, there's associated weight gain. Now this isn't for everyone, I'm just talking about the common side effect to be aware of, but a lot of people won't get any side effects. And uh, so please remember that. Uh, it's just something to be aware of to talk to your doctor if you do get it. And there's treatments for all of these as well. But yeah, it's good to know about. Now, something I haven't done justice to is that these um, first and second generations, um, or better called dopamine and, and serotonin dopamine receptor antagonists, um, uh, are often used in other conditions. So things like quetiapine, olanzapine, they're used in anxiety for sleep or in, in uh, yeah, they can be used for like um, in, in personality disorders to help um, calm, uh, you know, agitation. They might be used in eating disorders to stimulate appetite and help with sleep. Uh, and haloperidol can be used in people with dementia or Alzheimer's to help with, help with behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. And so there's a, there's a role in a lot of other conditions uh, with these medications. Now, I promised I would talk about third generation antipsychotics. Um, I kind of uh, think that this is a good term, actually. Like, well, I think there should be something to separate these drugs from the others. Like, these are things like Abilify, Caripazine, and Brexpiprazole. Um, sorry, Abilify is also Aripiprazole. That's just the drug name versus, sorry, the brand name versus the drug name. Now, these are partial agonists. These bind to receptors, but um, they, it binds strongly, but it doesn't totally block them. It, it only partially blocks them. So um, the thinking is, uh, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't let, allow for full blockade. So uh, you don't get full side effects, but you get partial blockade, which helps with the symptoms of the psychosis, but not, you're not getting the side effects. So does it work for everyone? No. Does it work for most people with, and most of them not get side effects? Yes. Maybe not most, but a lot. Um, and so they're very valuable medications. And the cool thing about them is you can use them in, conjun in conjunction with other medications uh, to help with side effects. So if you are on you know, risperidone uh, and you're having a problem with prolactin, sometimes you add Abilify and that will, affect, that will decrease the uh, problems with prolactin because it blocks the dopamine issue in the tuberoinfundibular pathway causing the prolactin issue. We'll talk about that in another video. But the point is they can, be work, they can work together. And then the final category, the fourth category, is its own drug. It's called clozapine. Clozapine is incredibly effective. I did a whole video talking about it, uh, and it mainly doesn't work through D2 blockade. So that shows you how complex, uh, you know, um, our, or, or how inadequate our understanding of, of, of psychosis is in terms of its neurobiology. Um, but clozapine is incredibly effective, uh, it's, but it's uh, because of side effects and the monitoring requirements, which is like weekly blood tests for four months, plus then monthly for the rest of your life, plus all other kind of monitoring stuff. Uh, it's usually used for treatment resistant psychosis. Um, and sometimes really it's used like off label in personality disorders. Worth saying in terms of the effectiveness of these medications, probably only a th third of people who start on an antipsychotic will stay on that antipsychotic. Um, most people, 60, 70% of people will have to chop and change and add and mix. Um, so, uh, and depending on what the indication is, whether it's a first psychotic episode or chronic schizophrenia, that'll dictate how long you need to take the medication for. You need to talk to your psych psychiatrist about um, what to do about that. Now, some factors that, now I said we talk about some factors uh, in deciding which ones to take. Now, we spoke about how the indication is the most important factor, like, um, you know, helping with sleep versus, and uh, you know, treatment resistance schizophrenia will have uh, different doses and different lengths of treatment. Um, but also insight is a big factor. If you, if you have, if you're on a treatment order, maybe they'll choose to use a depot, like an intramuscular injection of, uh, of the antipsychotic, which means that you don't have to remember to take pills every day. Um, or if you don't want to take pills every day, you're still getting the antipsychotic. Um, so some people who don't have insight into their psychosis, but are at risk of harming themselves and others and don't have capacity to consent or not consent to treatment will be put on an involuntary depot where they have to receive the medication in the muscle um, uh, because they wouldn't take medication. This is an infringement on their human right uh, because you're doing something against their will, but the, the court, uh, you know, the, the legal system has decided that um, due to their lack of capacity, the risks and harms of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, affecting their human rights uh, is outweighed by the benefits of them getting the antipsychotic depot. I guess the la a final point I want to make is if you feel the antipsychotic is not right for you, uh, instead of just stopping it without talking to your psychiatrist, 
um, please talk to your psychiatrist or at least let them know you've stopped it if you're voluntary and, and work with them to find the right regime for you because it is an art, you know, that it is quite complicated. If I bring up the college guidelines as, you know, uh, the first option of antipsychotic, there are five options. So, you know, and they all have different side effects. So you have to kind of, um, uh, kind of find out what the right option for you is. And that's only the first line. Then it becomes more and more complicated as uh, different mixes and matches can be made. Um, but there are many people with, you know, with psychosis, uh, with schizophrenia, who have, you know, meaningful, uh, wonderful lives who are on antipsychotics. Um, and, and it takes work, it's hard, but you can get there. All right, that's it for this video. Thank you for uh, tuning in. I wish you all a wonderful uh, day. And uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm doing this at, at uh, 7 a.m. before I start work. So <laughs> uh, I better get back to work. Uh, but I wish you all a wonderful day. All right. See ya.